God's design and uh, transgenderism. In 2017, a survey in Time Magazine asked people to offer a term that best fit their gender. As a result of this survey, they received more than 500 unique responses for people to describe what they believed that they were. Now, you might remember this one. Just a few years before that, in 2014, February of 2014, Facebook came out with 59 different genders, and Tumblr had 117. I think at that time, people sort of woke up and said, what is this? 59 genders, 117 genders. A lot of folks weren't even involved in the conversation, didn't even know this was a thing until it became part of public platforms. In a recent survey, 50% of young adults believe male and female aren't the only options for gender. I'm just trying to explain the world that we live in right now. In 2022, UCLA Williams Institute, in their survey and their data mining, say that 1.6 million people in the United States identify as transgender that are over 13 years old. I think when, as I've dived into, dove into gender studies over the last couple weeks, I've really felt underwater, like, wow, there's a lot to this. But I do think for folks that are over 30 or 35, they kind of think, man, this is, this is crazy. I don't, I don't understand any of this. But I do want you to know that our youth and our young adults, that they are immersed into this understanding that non-binary gender identities are not only assumed, but they're fashionable today. And even the thinking that binary terms like male, female could even be old school. That's how fast this conversation in gender is actually moving. I can't tell you how many times I read that the term transgender itself is becoming less popular because it still assumes male and female as the binary option. So not only is this cultural narrative growing in our world today, but I would say that it's growing away from us because we don't really understand it or know what's going on. I can imagine in a church our size that, and with the online reach, we don't have a massive online reach, but it's big enough to, uh, to know that there's a lot of perspectives that we may bring to this. I, I Listen, I know that. I know that when we approach a topic like this, and I can say, here's what the Bible says, there, there are plenty of people that might think, Pastor Ben, that's not maybe quite what I think or what I think the Bible says. But there are probably four categories of people here today, and you might find yourself outside of that. But here's one person, and I'm just trying to think about how some might be thinking um, as they're sitting here today. Ben, why talk about this? This is simple. Men are men, women are women. That's it. Move on to the book of James. <laughs> so that's, if you're new, that's, we're going to study the book of James soon. Some of you are there. Number two is, who cares? Let people do what they want to do. It doesn't affect me. Maybe the third category is, please help me with this. I'm struggling with my understanding of my own gender, deeply struggling, or my kids are struggling or my grandkids are struggling, and I really don't know what to do. I didn't think I'd be here facing this issue. And the fourth category of people could be, please be careful, Pastor Ben. People are struggling, and they need love and compassion. And I'm not saying that you're not that compassionate, but it could be that you're not going to be compassionate enough. Some of you might be thinking that just because this is a sensitive issue and you might be facing something in this arena that causes you to feel a certain way. So here's what I want to do. My goal, I don't know if I'll be able to do this, but my goal is to present truth about this issue, grace for the struggle, and wisdom for our application. Amen? And I would like to start by talking about terminology because I think words are important. So terminology related to transgenderism. I view myself as a missionary. I'm saved, I'm set apart for the gospel of Jesus. So whenever I think about anything in the world, I look at it as a missionary. As a missionary, if I go to another place where I'm not born, I'm gonna learn the culture, I'm gonna learn the language, I'm gonna try to understand how people think, so that I can reach them with the gospel that I believe. And I think it's an important thing for us to think about secularism and the things that we might disagree with biblically as another religion. That's the way that I see secularism. It is another religion. It's not a religion that the Bible affirms, but it is a religion of our times. And we see them from one generation to another. 
So we have to function and operate with the right terms. You and I have to understand the terms that are being used out here in society. We may not know what they are and we may not properly define them. And and I'll say it to you this way. Have you as a Christian ever been mischaracterized in what you believe? I have been in conversations where people who are not Christians are talking about Christianity in a way that is not true. And they're saying, you know, Christians believe this and I'm standing there a Christian pastor and looking at them saying, I don't, I am one and I don't believe that and I don't know anybody that believes that. You're mischaracterizing Christianity. I actually think sometimes people can be guilty of that with what other people believe. That we're using terms and we think we know what those terms mean, but we don't. And so I'm just trying to encourage that we get the terminology right, not because we agree with it, but because we have to understand it if we're going to speak into anyone's life. So here's what, here's what I want to share with you. Number one is the term sex. Now, I've shared with you before, the word sex in our culture is both a verb and a noun. Verb is action. Noun is talking about one's person. So this is a reference to one's biology, either male or female. A person's sex is determined by sexual anatomy, reproductive organs, hormones, and chromosomes. This is self-explanatory. But the second terminology is gender identity. This is a person's self-perception of whether they are male or female, masculine or feminine. Now, I'm just explaining to you what the culture believes here. Ten years ago, the word gender and sex were separated. They used to mean the same thing. Your sex was your gender. Your gender was your sex. In our culture, ten years ago, they were separated. And the reason that they were separated was to further the cultural narrative that you could be assigned, is what they would say. People would say, you are assigned a sex at birth but you, as you grow up, believe that you are something other than what you were assigned at birth. And so your gender identity is what you express as you choose to live that out in the world that you, as you develop. The third term is gender dysphoria. Nancy Piercy in her book, Love Thy Body, says, this is the sense of mismatch between physical sex or body and psychological gender identity, which is what you think in your mind. This term, gender dysphoria, was introduced by the American Psychiatric Association in their fifth edition of what some people will abbreviate as the DSM. The DSM is the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders. The DSM is a classification of mental disorders with associated criteria designed to help mental health professionals diagnose things properly. So this is basically the book that is used to help diagnose people in the spaces of of mental health. So you and I just have to understand that there has been a real shift from the 1970s when the first DSM book was created to 2013. Back then, the term for this gender dysphoria that we'll talk about today, it was called sexual deviancy. That was the term back then. Today, it's called gender dysphoria. Prior to 2013, it was called gender identity disorder, but that was changed. The language was shifted so that this would not be a stigmatizing term. And the reason for that is because the American Psychological or Psychiatric Association no longer holds themselves to the male-female binary, which means that our institutions believe you can be male or female even if that's not what you're born as. So our institutions believe this. You may not, but that's what the institutions believe. And as a result, when somebody has gender dysphoria, which there's a criteria, seven criteria to diagnose somebody with, when they come into a mental health specialist's office, the treatment for this starts with social affirmation. That's pronouns. Please call me by a different pronoun. I might be born as a woman, but I want you to refer to me as a man. So that's social affirmation. The second they can be encouraged then is legal affirmation. That's where a person changes their name. They change their ID on their card. It it helps them to feel a sense of security. The third is medical affirmation. That would be hormones, puberty blockers, and gender reassignment surgery. So this is sort of the track of treatment that is being offered in our culture and in our world today to those that struggle with gender dysphoria. The fourth term I want to bring to you today is transgender. This is an umbrella term for many ways in which some people experience an incongruence between their biological sex and their gender identity. A transgender person will often communicate that they feel trapped in another body. It's not who they are. That's something they would say. The fifth term, I'm only having six. I could have had 16, but the fifth term is intersex. 
This is a general term for a variety of conditions in which a person is born with a reproductive or sexual anatomy that doesn't seem to fit within the typical definitions. So there could be an abnormality uh, physically or, or otherwise. It could be chromosomal. Actually, this is a point of debate right now. You may not know this, but I dove in to the philosophy of intersex, and it, it's, it's a long rabbit trail, friends. There are right now at least 15 classifications for what identifies a person as intersex. It used to be more simple, but it no longer is. There's 15 different classifications that I could read. I counted them. And in this place, there is a, a lot of difficulty in this particular people group because part of what's being said today is that my parents or the doctor chose for me what I would become and it's caused consequences. And so if you can imagine, there's a massive debate over this uh, today, and I don't want to bring you down that, but I would say that the statistics are very difficult to understand. Some would say that one out of every hundred persons are intersex. Some would say one out of every thousand. And it really, when you read statistics about intersex people, you just have to understand that there's a lot of classifications. There's a lot of information for you to know. So it's hard to pick and just as a person who's looked at the stats recently, it's difficult to actually know what you're talking about. So just want to throw that out there in case you're confused. Number six is non-binary gender identity. This is a gender identity other than male-female, also referred to as gender queer, gender fluid, pangender, gender non-conforming, or omnigender. And there's maybe a, uh, there's so many more, uh, as Facebook has has told us. So these are terms. These are, these are terms that are out there today. I would encourage you to understand at least what people are talking about. You don't need to be a philosophy major on gender. You don't have to get 170,000 people last year uh, got a gender studies degree major in college. Usually that's used in justice work or social work or something, but like this is like really increased. Gender studies is not going away. It's actually increasing every single year. More and more people are getting their degree in that space. And it's not all, the gender studies are not all negative. It came out of the feminist movement, as you can understand, back in the 50s. So there's a long history of this, even if you're not aware of it. So one of the things I want to do is talk about the cultural beliefs about transgenderism. Now, there's lots. There's a dozen or more, but these are some that I interact with that I think you'll be able to identify. The first one is gender identity is a social construct. That's one of the cultural beliefs. This is the belief that male-female binary is not a biological fact, but it's been imposed on us at birth. You'll hear the term sex assigned at birth. You'll hear that term. But I think the conundrum for that term, sex assigned at birth, it carries a lot of implication that don't seem to make sense. Like it sort of carries the idea that the doctor or the parent somehow chose that birth like arbitrarily, like they just sort of picked it out and there were no biological markers. It was just sort of a desire. It's it, it sort of sex assigned at birth, like as if there wasn't anything to determine that. That's kind of where this is going in uh, it used to be gender assigned at birth, but now it's sex assigned at birth. So it's very important when you're reading literature, this is going pretty far. And people believe that sex is assigned at birth based on stereotypes. Now, not everybody believes in this camp. Not everybody believes what I just said, but it's a growing number that, that actually ascribed to, uh, to the, they subscribe to this. As we analyze this claim, here's what I think is really important, though, as Christians, people who want to follow the Bible, and we listen to what the culture is saying. What we want to do is analyze this and follow the logic. And uh, I realize this can be like a political talking point, but if you could just put your ballots aside for a second, I'm not going to ask you how to vote today. I'm not talking from just a, a conservative perspective, but I do think it's important that we follow logic where logic takes us. So if I were to tell you today that I was a 10-year-old boy, I don't think you would believe me. If I were to tell you that I was um, eight feet tall, I don't think you'd believe me. If I told you I was Asian American, I got a lot of Asian American friends in the room right now, and one of them came up to me last service and said, hey, don't worry, we forgive you. <laughs> that you're not Asian American, whatever. It is, it is great. It's great. Um, you wouldn't believe me. Why wouldn't you believe me? You wouldn't believe me because we have accepted based on evidence that those things are not real about me. 
But we have moved this discussion about gender into something entirely different, haven't we? We've said that those markers, those biological markers, that evidence that we've gone by no longer applies. That's what the culture is saying, and it's getting stronger and stronger by the day. The second cultural belief is my body does not define my identity. Nancy Piercy in her book, Love Thy Body, says, today the accepted treatment is not to help persons change their inner feelings of gender identity to match their body, but to change their body through hormones and surgery to match their feelings. In other words, when a person senses a dissonance between body and mind, the mind wins. The body is dismissed as irrelevant, and this is a terribly low view of the body. We do live in a world that screams, you were born this way, but they do not mean it because they can change what they want to change. And that's what is being told in the culture today. What our culture is really saying is you can be whatever you want and we'll help you make that happen by any means. To further illustrate this, I think we can understand if a 16 year old girl walks into a doctor's office and she's five foot four and she weighs hundred pounds and she tells the doctor, I am terribly overweight. 30 pounds overweight, what would we expect that doctor to do? Would we expect the doctor to say, we're going to put you on diet pills. I'm going to give you a diet so that you can lose weight. In fact, why don't we send you through weight loss surgery? No, I think that we would find a doctor who did something like that as abusive in their practice. We wouldn't just disagree. We would disagree in the strongest of terms. That doctor, we would expect them to send that person to a mental health specialist. We would expect that doctor not to do anything about their physical body, but to send that girl to someone who can help her with what's going on in her mind. And what I'm saying today when it comes to gender, that is not the narrative. What we are doing is we are sending people to not just mental health specialists, we're sending them to specialists who can help them go down a road to change their outward appearance and their physical body rather than to help them with their mind. And I submit to you today that this is causing irreversible damage. And if you think that there's no proof for that, then I would submit to you by saying this. The UK is probably five to seven years ahead of us when it comes to gender studies and uh, the activity that they're, that the path that they're following in, in all of this. Something that has recently happened as of last year, the UK recently closed Tavistock, which is the only dedicated gender identity clinic for children and young people. And they did that after receiving over a thousand lawsuits from various families. The lawsuits range from overlooking other medical factors and disorders to rushing to life-changing puberty blockers and irreversible sex reassignment surgery. Thousands and thousands of children have been left with daily consequences and irreparable damage. When we think about what compassion looks like, I do want to balance that out. I know people struggle, and I think maybe none of us are as compassionate as we ought to be with what people are struggling with. If you said to me today, Pastor Ben, you're not compassionate enough, I would agree. I, I don't think any of us can stand up and say, I'm really compassionate with people that struggle in this place. Like, listen, we all have to grow in, in all of these things, 100%, 100%. There's no defense there. But what, what I would also submit to you is that doesn't compassion also include helping someone not go down a path that is going to cause irreparable damage? Doesn't compassion include actually saying that doing this to our children is killing them, hurting them, harming them, and we shouldn't be doing this to children? Is, isn't that, doesn't that include compassion? So yes, Ben, we should absolutely care about what's going on in people's minds and struggles, not just this issue, but other issues. But at the same time, I think it's important that we look at what the UK is doing. And UK is not the only country. They're not the only nation doing this. Finland's following them. Sweden and other countries are following suit. And the United States has so far chosen not to do that. We are still not following what I think we ought to. And it's an important thing for us to recognize that our culture might be screaming this, but they're not saying some other things that are really important for us to actually know. What's going on in someone's mind can be deeply complicated and we need to be compassionate, but changing a person's body or person to accommodate that struggle is clearly not healthy. The third cultural belief is embracing your transgender identity should be celebrated. Today, it's encouraged for our kids to explore their gender through public education even. 
books that are being written in all other forms, and they're being encouraged to be whatever they want to be. Seattle Children's Hospital actually has opened a gender clinic offering puberty blockers to stop the body from making the hormones that start puberty. This is provable that it is causing irre irreversible damage. It should not be celebrated. It should not be celebrated. But we have Bruce Jenner to Demi Lovato. We're moving from gender fluid to pansexual, and we are told this is good for people, this is good for society, and it's not. The fourth cultural belief is validation and affirmation equals love, acceptance, and causes trans people to flourish. That's the idea, is that we, if we're on the side of compassion and the side of love, that we have to validate, we have to affirm, we have to agree, and that's what it means. That's what's going to cause the suicidality and the suicide ideation to go down. That's what we're told, that if you don't agree with this, that if you don't celebrate, that if you don't affirm, that if you don't love, that if you don't come alongside people and say what you're doing is great, that you're killing people and you're transphobic even being told that you don't believe these people exist. No, I believe everyone exists that's struggling with something. 100% we believe it. But we're being told by those comments that if you don't celebrate or validate or affirm that you're transphobic, you're a bigot, and you're part of the problem. Many kids are choosing a trans lifestyle not because they have gender dysphoria, but because it's popular. I want you to picture this. I'm going to have some of you, like, if you're triggered, power down a little bit. <laughs> because I can feel it in the force. <laughs> yeah. And I'm not looking for claps and I'm not looking for, you know, it takes courage. I'm just, this is out of, out of my heart. Like, just think about this. Let's go into another direction for a second. Off script. Let's say that you were five, six years old and in the neighborhood and the place that you grew up, that you don't feel like you fit. You're a boy and you don't feel like you're as masculine or as boyish as the other boys. And you don't like sports and you don't like to punch each other and wrestle. You like art and you're sensitive. And you're being told by that group of boys and maybe even by family members that you're feminine and maybe you're gay and maybe you're a woman. And you're being told those things. Imagine the older that you get, the more the culture tells you, you probably are a woman. So there's a voice that comes alongside the struggle that many of us have existed in, by the way. How many women have told me they were called a tomboy when they were young and it really hurt them? How many men had, uh, had something about them that wasn't as masculine as other men and they're being told that they're not manly? because of some of the things we've contributed to, maybe not you, but our society, our world, and maybe even us and our family. We're, being, we're, tell, we're contributing probably to this problem. If we wanna look at being compassionate, we probably have to back off a little bit of how it is that we define men and how it is that we define women. Do we ha need to have definitions? Yes, let them be biblical though, amen. I can't tell you how many times I've been, I've listened to sermons where some tough guy was telling men what men are like. And I'm looking at him and I'm like, I don't want your version. It's just come off like tough and angry and like men go, yeah, this is great. You know, beer and Bible. Awesome. Yeah, that's all great. This is lame. It's not, it's not good. It's not healthy. So, when you have a culture that is affirming something that is happening, a struggle that's happening on the inside, you can imagine how the enemy is at work all the way through our childhood to make us believe things that are not true. The, the enemy will destroy you no matter how it works. Let's just pick the thing that works. That's his plan. I want to kill you by any means necessary. And right now in our culture, this is one of the areas that we're facing. I will not deny that some people really do struggle with gender dysphoria. They really do. They, they feel like they're in the wrong body. There's this sense in them. I don't understand that, but like I know that's a reality for some people. And, and at the same time, I also know that people who don't feel valuable and people who don't feel valid when a culture celebrates something and says you're a hero, when you take a stand and you step out and you present yourself as something else, and now all of a sudden you get this feeling, these accolades, this freedom, you start to feel good about yourself. And all of a sudden you're like, I've never felt like this in my life. I must be the opposite gender. That is happening in an increased rate. In fact, it's doubling and tripling in the next generation. Transgenderism has stayed almost stagnant for so many years until this generation rose up. Now it's like tripling. The rate at which this is growing is unprecedented. And so we have something that we're dealing with here. 
And misgendering people can even by, by accident cause offense. I did it not that long ago. And in Canada, it's illegal on a federal level to misgender people. That's how far this is uh, going to go. It's coming. It's coming. It's going to be stronger in the days ahead. But I think we have to look at this also on a practical level, which is really what most of us deal with on a day-to-day. -day. And I would tell you, I mean, the gender thing to me is kind of interesting because I do think we need a broader category of genders. And I hope you understand what I'm trying to say there. L let, me, let me further illustrate that just in a funny thing. I went to get coffee at one of these really... I don't know how else to say it other than like snobbish places, you know? I'm like a straight up, give me nitro cold brew, it tastes like acid, I'm good, you know, whatever. But I do like a little flavor in, in, in my coffee. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not like, I don't want to grow more hair because of this, whatever. <laughs> so somebody in the room knows that I get the sweet cream in my, whatever, all right? I like the sweet cream, amen. Can I get an amen? This is like, put some, I mean, if you're doing the intermittent fasting, you're like, no amen, I'm, I can't even have caloric intake. But so I go to this place and I offer a vanilla, I, I order a vanilla latte and the guy kind of scoffs at me. Now I'm going to tell you exactly how it happened. I, I'm not going to tell you. He just goes. <laughs> and then the barista bro starts making my coffee. And, uh, and then he's like holding back his comments. And then he says to me, you know, that's not a manly drink. That's a floofy drink. And I'm just, I'm just standing, yeah, yeah, he didn't know Ben Dixon. What are you trying to, he's like, yeah, I'm saying. It's like that's a, he said, that's a floof, I don't even know what floofy is. What does floofy mean? Sir, that's not in the dictionary. I don't know what you're talking about. I didn't do, I didn't, I was thinking it. I didn't say it. Shoot, grammar's a thing, buddy. Uh, okay, so he's stereotyping me based on my drink. He's a real men drink black coffee as we said. Okay, so now I want to tell you what's in my mind. I'm looking at him, and he has, he looks like he, have you ever seen the movie Grease? He looks like a guy that came out of Greece. So he's got the white the t-shirt, white and it's all rolled up, and then he's got his pants, very expensive, real rolled up, every, nice boots, real clean, everything's nice. His hair looks like he's definitely spent about an hour and a half on it. This is 30 seconds right here, you know. So he's like, he is all in, he is, he, 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 he's fitted. He, you know what I mean? Even like the, the way he makes the coffee, he's got a rhythm and a way. And I'm looking at him and I'm like, oh brother, you're the last person that should be talking about what a man, you know? And so I'm stereotyping him and he's stereotyping me. <laughs> and this is a messed up world we live in. But I, <laughs> my point is, my point is, is that I said to him, I said, sir, I don't believe a man is defined by what they drink, but by the way they live. And he, and he stopped us. You can clap for that if you want. <laughs> but, but I'm just talking about stereotypes. You understand? That, like, if you said, Ben, do you think there is an issue in, in that arena? Yes, in that arena. And that's why some people are able to hear some of what the culture is saying in ways that, that the en I believe the enemy is working in. I, I do. I think that people don't feel like they fit. How many of you at one point in your life, in one way or another, felt like you didn't fit? Just raise your hand. How many of you are not being honest right now about? <laughs> so many people have told me they didn't fit for one reason or another. It's a, phenom it's a human experience. It really is. And I would tell you that, that this is something that we're going to continue to deal with. But what does the Bible say about gender? Now, I want to be clear up front. I do not believe that you can adopt the gender ideology of today without dismissing and undermining the doctrine of the authority of Scripture. Amen. I do not believe it's possible. Amen. So what does the Bible say about gender? Number one, human beings were created in the image of God. The secular world will tell us that we are all the result of a mindless evolutionary process and we do not have purpose. If they don't say we don't have purpose, it certainly is an implication of that teaching. But the Bible says something quite different. The Bible tells us there's a designer and he made us with intention and purpose. It says in Genesis 1.26, then God said, let us make mankind in our own image and in our own likeness. This passage in Genesis tells us that humans are not some afterthought and they were not created randomly or by chance. And you probably need to hear that today. 
You're not created randomly or by chance. Human beings are the pinnacle of God's creation, and we were given the stewardship of the entire earth. We were carefully and wonderfully made in God's image, and we even share some of his attributes. That's what it means, that we're special. Whether we feel it or not, we are special. Now, we don't share all of God's attributes, God's omniscient, God's omnipresent. I would love to share omniscience. That would be a great conversation, wouldn't it? I already know the past, the present, and the future. But God doesn't share all of his attributes, but he does share with us human beings love and mercy. These are the things that we get to share. The attributes of God were made in his image. We were made with a body and a soul fully integrated, which is entirely important in our created order. Our body matters to God. He designed it with 37 trillion cells. It is not an accident. God's design is masterful. You and I are amazing. Again, our mind might tell us different, but it is truth. Your body is amazing. Have you ever made something with your hands and you step back and you went like, that is not awesome? <laughs> you ever created something and you step back and you thought, let's try again. <laughs> and you scrapped it. It wasn't worth keeping. When God stepped back from his creation in verse 31 of Genesis, he said, it is good. Yeah. It's good. You are good. Amen. Scripture says that our bodies are wonderfully made, set apart for God, temples of the Holy Spirit. And it even says in 1 Corinthians chapter 6 that our bodies are united to Christ. The second point is our gender was designed by God and it is a part of who we are. Being made in his image includes our gender distinction as male and female. It's biologically written into what you are. Genesis 127, he created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them male and female. He said that it was good. Our gender is very good. The purpose of two genders in Genesis chapter two is made very clear. He tells us, the Lord God said, it is not good for man to be alone. Come on, man, go ahead and say amen now. <laughs> I will make him a helper suitable for him. Now, this Hebrew word for helper is not a term of condescension. It's not a term that is subordinate, like the woman is less than the man. That's not true because this same word helper is used throughout the Old Testament of God helping his people Israel. It's not a term of condescension. It's not a term of dominance or domination. This is a term to me that expresses essential equality. And I believe this with all my heart. Men and women are essentially equal. They are very similar, but not the same. And the distinction between men and women matters. And that's why God made us the way that he did. And we need to consider it this way, that there is something in a man and there's something in a woman that God put in there. And he wants to express through you as the God-given gender that you are. He wants to express who he is and what he's like through who you are and through what you are. This distinction matters. God created Eve out of Adam and brought them together in order to accomplish in unity what they could not do alone. Jesus affirmed gender when reflecting on marriage and covenant as God's design from the beginning. He says this later on in all of the Gospels, except for John. And this shows us that gender is not some arbitrary thing. It's not a self-defined thing. We don't get to choose it. It carries purpose and meaning innately, implicitly. It does. We may not know that. We may not understand that. We might even struggle with that, but it is the truth. He made them male and female. It is good. So what happened? Why do we struggle? Well, that's easy. Theologically, practically, it might be a deep struggle, but it's easy to understand. And this is found in the theology that we teach, systematic theology, soft plug for the class. The fall caused all humans to experience internal conflict. The theological term for the fall is our sin and our disobedience to God. It caused depravity, it caused chaos, it caused confusion that we all live in today. When God told Adam and Eve not to disobey because he knew what it would cause, it did cause that. He told them, don't eat from this tree. It was about obedience. It wasn't God drawing a line and saying, let's see how much they really love me. Let's see if they can do it. Well, fail, first of all. <laughs> he was drawing a line and he told them not to cross that line. Don't do this because if you do this, I can see through the corridor of time what's going to be unleashed if you disobey me. 
If you choose a path that is not following me, if you choose that path, I'm telling you whatever path, whatever that is and wherever it leads, it's going to destroy you and people around you. So when God said, don't do it, he, he wasn't trying to punish. He wasn't, he wasn't trying to be mean about drawing a line and seeing who would or wouldn't. He was saying, don't do that. And we did. And it unleashed hell on planet earth. The struggles, not only in the externals that we face, but also internally. And Paul actually talks about this. He says in Romans 5 that death entered through Adam's sin. The way that I look at this word death is that when Adam and Eve sinned, God put an expiration date on them at that point. You know, when you go to the store and you buy some meat or something like that, and it has an expiration date, what happens slowly over time? It starts to decay. That meat doesn't look the same 10 days later. Now you might say, well, Pastor Ben, I put it in my freezer. It does. (laughs) I'm not talking to you right now. Okay. You probably got a whole big freezer and you're waiting for the rapture or something. I don't know. (laughs) You probably got one in your car right now. Amen. (laughs) I got snacks. All right. So (laughs) I got to be funny somewhere in here, guys. You got to breathe. You know, we're talking about something serious here today. Okay. So you get offended, then forgive. I don't know. He says, death entered in through Adam and it's affected all of us. There's an expiration date on humanity. And so Jesus obviously comes And even though we give our hearts to Jesus, if you've given your life to Jesus, the Spirit of God lives in you, and the Bible says that you're going to have a new body. Amen? You're going to live forever. That's what it tells us. So the expiration date is on this body, but the Bible says you're going to get a new body, but in this life, you still have an inner struggle. Paul talks about this in Romans 7, verse 22. He says, For in my inner being I delight in God's law, but I see another law at work in me waging war against the law of my mind and making me a prisoner of the law of sin within me. Now, I'm not trying to make this a transgender verse, but I am trying to say that the struggle that we face, this internal conflict of what we think and how we feel and how we're influenced and what we're told about truth, there's a struggle on the inside of us and that's why he gave us a book. That's why he gave us a book, because God knew in his wisdom, if they don't have a book, they're going to get it wrong in every generation. We already made a mess. Humans have made a mess. You read history, that's one thing you know. We've made a mess. We have mistreated each other, harmed each other, and we still do it today. But by God's grace, he's helping us. He's redeeming and renewing all things. He gave us a book. Praise be to God. Thank you for that wisdom. Pastor Ben, we didn't gather for you. We wanted the book. Amen. (laughs) We wanted the book. What does it say? The effects of sin are something that all of us deal with to some degree. And some people, it's an issue of gender. The answer is not change yourself based on how you feel, what you are told, or your mental struggle. What is the answer? Well, number four, the answer is the gospel calls everyone to surrender their body and renew their mind. The gospel calls you and I to surrender our bodies. Not just give God, oh, you can have eternity. Thank you for forgiveness for when I sin and heaven when I die. The the Bible calls us in Christ to lay down everything about who we are. Everyone. Gender ideology teaches people to change their body and obey their mind. This is a false doctrine and it comes with a false promise. Because the idea goes like this. If you obey that struggle, then you're going to feel better about yourself. And friends, it's not true. That's a false prophecy. The voice of God is calling us totally different. I'm not saying that people won't have struggles. They certainly will. We will, you will, and it may be in this area. But with that struggle, the Bible calls us to surrender our mind and to surrender our body. Look what it says here. Paul says, Romans 12, verse 1. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your, everybody say bodies. 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 Your entire self. There's no dichotomy here. There's no split between body and soul. We're a fully integrated being. He's saying, offer your body, your entire self as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. You want to know what God wants? That's what God wants. A full surrender. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of the world that will tell you all these other things, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. Paul says this, You cannot know what God wants until you fully present yourself. You will not hear God's word truthfully 
in the right way, unless you are living in a full surrender, you can't know God's will. It will not happen. So wherever there's a negotiation of surrender, wherever that, wherever that happens, truth, God's truth is not going to be fully followed. It will not even be fully understood. In our culture, the pattern of this world is very different from God's word. And some have this tension in their mind with regard to their body. And again, I say to you, the answer is not that people change their body or express themselves with unrestrained freedom. The answer is to surrender ourselves to Christ where he will bring true freedom. That's where freedom comes from, is the surrender to Christ. I was thinking about how sometimes the concept of self-denial to a lot of Christians brings pain. Like, oh, I've got to deny myself. And it's so hard, Pastor Ben, it's so hard. It might feel that way, but I think it's because we misunderstand something. And C.S. Lewis speaks about this in The Weight of Glory. This is what he says, and listen carefully because he uses language I wouldn't use, but this is really powerful. About self-denial, he says, the New Testament has lots to say about self-denial, but not about self-denial as an end in itself. We are told to deny ourselves and take up our crosses in order that we might follow Christ. And nearly every description of what we shall ultimately find if we do so contains an appeal to desire. If there lurks in most modern minds the notion that to desire our own good and earnestly to hope for the enjoyment of it is a bad thing, I submit that this notion has crept in from worldly philosophy and is no part of the Christian faith. Indeed, if we consider the unblushing promises of reward and the staggering nature of the rewards promised to us in the Gospels, it would seem that our Lord finds our desires not too strong, but too weak. We are half-hearted creatures fooling about with drink and sex and ambition when infinite joy is offered to us. Like an ignorant child who wants to go on making mud pies in the slum because he cannot imagine what is meant by the offer of a holiday at sea. We are far too easily pleased. If you don't know what he said there, he says self-denial is the doorway into the joy and the peace and the satisfaction that Christ offers to us. He's saying self-denial is not punishment from God. Saying no to your inner desires, saying no to your flesh is not somehow punishment to us. It's actually an invitation to the more that God has that we will not know unless we deny those things. When Jesus says, take up your cross and follow me, he isn't saying follow me to just some painful place that's gonna equal dread for your life. He's saying it might look like this to you right now, but it is joy and it is eternity and it is peace and it satisfies inside you what you're longing for. The God that made us knows how to lead us. The God that created men and women knows how to satisfy those internal conflicts. He alone does. The designer is the definer. And friends, I'm saying that we will all struggle until we get that part right. Self-denial is a gift to the Christian to say, I will follow Christ and I believe that where he takes me is the best place for me. And if I've got to put down these other things in this life, it might call out to me from the inside and the culture might say something from the outside, but this is the best place for me to find myself in Christ and Christ alone. The message of this culture from the Christian's perspective is our life is to glorify God. And that is what life is about. And whenever we talk about anything and it isn't through the filter of me glorifying God, we're already in the wrong place. So today, I may not be the right person to talk about transgenderism, but I can talk to you about surrendering to Christ. I can definitively tell you that whatever your struggle might be, surrendering to Christ is the answer. Giving your whole life to Christ is the answer. And it is not a one and done. It starts one day, but then it continues every day. We give our life to Jesus every day in every way. He is worthy of of it. He is worthy of it. And he is the only one worthy of it. I gave you a number of practical application points, but I don't have the time to go through them with you today. But I thought about how to close this sermon because I don't know how to close this message. <laughs> Not because I was worried about it, because I'm just like, I think we should pray. Some of you find yourself really high over here on the compassion, compassion spectrum. And you just, you just, you think a certain way and some it's all about truth. So we just got to tell everybody the truth and that's it. 
I think somewhere in the middle, it's, it's grace and truth. We need to be clear about what God's word says. It's true. But then, Lord, would you help us with love and compassion so that we can reach people in the world that are just like us, maybe in a different way. Help us to do that. And we need God's help to do that. Amen. Amen. Would you stand? Let's pray. Let's cry out together for just a moment. Ask God for your own life to become more truthful, more compassionate. Ask God for others in our world and this city and this this nation for God to pour out his spirit. There's a revival that's going on and God is doing it. God needs to do it. So Father, we come to you. We thank you in the mighty name of Jesus today. And Lord, we thank you that you're pouring your spirit out on all people. That's what Acts 2 says. I will pour my spirit out on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Young men will dream dreams and old men will see visions. And even on my bond slaves, both male and female, they shall prophesy. And I thank you, Lord, that even in cultural confusion, and chaos, Lord, and things that maybe I'm not, I don't understand. I believe what you're doing is pouring out your spirit and you're leading people to Christ. And your promise is that all who call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. So God, we pray for a revival that touches the streets and not just the skyscrapers. It touches people who are in deep, dire need, and maybe they're not crying out to you. They're not asking for you. And maybe they have had, have had a bad representation of you. But Lord, you're perfect. And what you do is right and righteous. And I'm I'm praying that, Lord, you would touch hearts, you would touch lives, and you would give us opportunity and influence where we could speak into things that maybe we don't know, but we do know that you're the answer. So God, would you visit us today in a very powerful, a very special way and give us your heart and your truth for how we are to progress into this world that we often don't understand because you made us for something else. You made us for another world, a new heavens and a new earth. And there's a longing in us for that. But Lord, make us fruitful here and now. So I thank you for our church. Use us for your glory, we pray in Jesus' mighty name. And everyone said...